Hello everybody, good afternoon. And uh, I'd like to start by actually thanking all uh, the uh, speakers preceding me, uh, uh, the Dean, uh, Professor Sheila Konateb, uh, 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 and uh, Marisa, who has really touched my, my heart uh, by her remarks, and of course, uh, Professor uh, Robinson. And I promise you, Professor, that uh, maybe one day, given the state of affairs of the peace process, you and I will join SAWAS as professors and will enjoy the Jamaican atmosphere there, uh, hopefully. Uh, very soon. Uh, now, uh, 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 I am really grateful to be asked to give the Reverend Richard uh, Pearson annual lecture today at the world-renowned Harris School uh, of Public Policy. Uh, it is uh, a particular honor to be speaking at the University of Chicago. Knowing uh, your motto, where fun comes to die, <laughs> I regret not being uh, with you in person today for many reasons, but one of them actually is missing out on getting the teacher the t-shirt the with this famous motto on it. Hopefully, I'll do that on my next visit. Academic and intellectual rigor does not reduce the level of fun, I'm definitely certain. And it is inspiring, inspiring to learn that the University of Chicago has the highest Nobel Prize laureates of all universities wo worldwide. You even insisted that President Obama was only an adjunct professor. Thankfully, he added another Nobel Prize. I know you have previously heard here about the successful conclusion of the Colombia conflict, the Irish uh, peace processes, and from those who were close to the heart of those uh, negotiations. I am absolutely honored that you have chosen a Palestinian, uh, 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 perhaps as a counterpoint uh, 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 for uh, uh, the third uh, annual lecture in this very prestigious uh, series. Uh, ours, after all, has the dubious distinction of being one of the longest running in international conflicts in the world today. And unlike Colombia or Ireland, ours seem to be as far away uh, from resolution as ever, which is strange because it is not that complicated, actually, Marisa. In fact, ours is unique too in that nowhere else has there been such broad international consensus for so long about what resolution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict would look like. And still, no, res no resolution is in sight. It is exceptional, and for us, the people of Palestine, it is absolutely tragic. If Chicago is the city of broad shoulders, Palestinians have had to be a nation of broad so shoulders. Much has been placed upon us. Whatever we have gained, we have had to work hard for it even official recognition, and we seem to be moving backwards, unfortunately. The reason I cannot be with you in person today is that our relations with the U.S. administration have regressed. Since I had to leave the U.S. last year, the Trump administration has been engaged in a relentless campaign to de-recognize and delegitimize the Palestinian people and its leadership. This has reached a point where we need to pause after legal advice that has been given to us before traveling to the U.S. to accept your generous invitation to address an imp important American audience and be part of this very promising debate in the U.S. about Palestine. That is why I speak to you today from London. And my friends, ladies and gentlemen, as we have seen with the recently concluded Israeli elections only two days ago, these are indeed transformative times for us all. Benjamin Netanyahu will almost certainly lead a new far-right Israeli coalition government. It is clear that a majority of Israelis have voted for the status quo. They have voted for continued and deepening occupation. They have rejected what passes for the left in Israel and voted instead for far-right ideologies that mirror populism and phobic votes elsewhere in the world today. They have voted against their fellow Palestinian citizens. They have rejected any kind of peace process that factors in the Palestinian side. With it, they have rejected the two-state solution. The fact that until Netanyahu vowed to annex more illegal settlements in the occupied territory, the Palestinian issue was not even a factor in the election campaign proves this very point. We are therefore facing challenges that are striking and are asking us fundamental questions, very fundamental questions. They are asking fundamental questions of all of us, but Palestinians 
are at the tip of the needle. The Trump administration has proven to be intrinsically and ideologically unilateralist on foreign policy. This is a serious challenge to the post-World War II rules-based global order. It is an acute and immediate challenge to Palestinian people. Why, of all the conflicts in the world, is it ours where there has been unprecedented global consensus for so long that remains unresolved? Is the problem with the international order itself, we are asking? Is it the problem, uh, 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 our adherence to it? Is that is the problem, our adherence to international order? Or is it about execution? And these are very relevant questions today. And in, in light of the U.S. Secretary of State Mike, Mike Pompeo silence only this last Tuesday on whether he was asked in the Congress on whether the U.S. would recognize any illegal annexation by Israel of the West Bank settlements, as promised by Netanyahu only two days earlier, in light of this and his utter silence and not responding, and in light of the Trump administration's lack of support for a two-state solution, you might well think that I should simply be saying goodbye to you today. I should be saying goodbye to the two-state solution, goodbye to the 25 years of peace efforts, 25 years of state building, achievements, and goodbye to the international order, perhaps altogether. But we are not willing to do that. We are not willing to give up and wind the clock backward. We are not willing to abandon international law or international order. I am simply here to explain what our strategy is and what it has been for some time. First, let me make one thing absolutely clear. We know nothing of the Trump administration's so-called ultimate deal. We can draw our own conclusions, but we are not privy to any specific proposals coming out of Washington. The Palestinian leadership under President Mahmoud Abbas took a strategic decision back on December 6, 2017, to not work with this administration. We did so after first trying to engage at the highest level with this administration. President Abbas met President Trump in Washington in May 2017. Only in the preceding four months, our president and us met President Trump three times more than the first time in May. We met the president and his team uh, four times in a, in a, in a period of a few uh, uh, months, engaging at the highest level, making sure that our voice will be heard. Uh, uh, we met the uh, team of President Trump numerous times. We lost count, perhaps more than 30 times. I, myself, as the ambassador in Washington, and my colleagues from uh, Palestine have been engaging the team. I was, in fact, sent to Washington shortly, shortly before the uh, visit of our president with the very express brief to engage this administration in order to secure a commitment to international law, a commitment to all that we have built, a commitment to the long-held U.S. policy. Unfortunately, it was to absolutely no avail. It was clear we were too late. This administration's mind was made up from day one before we even had the chance to engage them. The final straw for us was when, despite assurances just a week earlier, the White House announced it would move the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. Before that, we had been informed that the U.S. would close the PLO mission in Washington, the mission I used to head in Washington, just shortly before that, in November 16, 2017. That was right at the height of our engagement, at the height of our honeymoon, if you may. We have no trust in this administration. We do not want to be part of a cover-up. We do not want to grant this administration's plans for our conflict and illegitimacy by engaging it. If and when this administration's ultimate deal is revealed, it must be clearly and unambiguously be understood for what it is, devised only with Israel, only with Netanyahu himself, unilaterally, illegally. We are not obstructionists, however. At every turn, at every turn, we seek to be constructive. In February of last year, our president, President Abbas, traveled to New York to the Security Council to make specific proposals to the UN on how do we move forward. He called for an international conference to implement international law and, above all, the preservation of the two-state solution and the two-state principle. 
His proposal included a number of specific steps, including the convening of an international conference to stimulate the rights and duties of each party based on the principle of mutual recognition, mutual recognition, and a, multi, a multilateral mechanism to help the parties abide by and implement international law. And my friends, in short, President Abbas, on behalf of the people of Palestine, called for internationalizing peacemaking. That was called the Palestinian Peace Plan, PPP. We did so in support of the two-state solution. We are keeping our commitments under international law. We are keeping our commitments to international order. We want the international community to keep its commitment to us. And ladies and gentlemen, the Trump administration has uh, pursued four policies that have pulled the rug from under any meaningful peace process. And let me name and explain these four policies that have been pursued by the Trump administration. Number one, it has sought since day one to legitimize the illegitimate, legalize the illegal. Not only has it moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem and recognized the city as Israel's capital in contravention with international law and international cons consensus, but also has recognized Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights. It has done so unilaterally. It has set a precedent for Palestinian occupied territory where Netanyahu has promised he will extend Israeli sovereignty to more illegal settlements in occupied territories. Of course, that would encourage Netanyahu and add to his expansionist and territorial appetite. Number two of such policies of the Trump administration, it has sought to denationalize and de-recognize the Palestinian people and our leadership. It has closed the PLO mission in Washington, severing decades-long relations, historic relationships. It has ignored us and misled, misled us since we engaged it. It has defunded UNRWA, the UN agency that serves the Palestinian refugees, trying to impose a definition on who and who cannot be called a Palestinian refugee. Not to mention the number of Congress resolutions against the people of Palestine and their representatives in the last months only. Number three of these policies, it has sought to de-internationalize the conflict. I repeat, de-internationalize the conflict. The administration has treated international law with contempt. By recognizing the annexation of the Golan Heights, it has undermined one of the foundation stones of the post-World War II order, the inadmissibility of acquiring land by force. It harbors open hostility to the UN and any other international body. Former U.S. envoy to the U.N., Nikki Haley, was explicit about wanting to punish any U.N. agency that did anything that could be perceived as holding Israel accountable. I mean, she spent two years just primarily about dismantling the international framework that governs the Palestinian issue. The U.S. pulled out of UNESCO because we joined UNESCO. It pulled out of the U.N. Human Rights Commission because the UN Human Rights Commission is doing its responsibility and its work. Just last week, the US revoked the visa of the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. All this, all this is an attempt at rendering international mediation and law irrelevant. All this is only to protect Israel and put it above the law. And number four of these policies, which in my opinion is becoming absolutely clear and perhaps most damaging, is trying to turn our conflict into a purely domestic Israeli issue. May I repeat this? It's trying to reframe the conflict from an Arab-Israeli conflict, not even a Palestinian-Israeli conflict, but the whole Palestinian issue, the 13 million Palestinians, is an internal issue of Israel. Israel has publicly distanced itself from the two-state solution. I mean by Israel, the Israeli government. There has been no protest from the administration whatsoever. Instead, the administration has decided to abandon the long-held U.S. position in support of the two-state solution itself. And hear this, please. The U.S. Consulate General to Palestine in Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem, which was established in, nine, in, in, in 18, to be precise, in 1844, 1844, has now been relocated to the U.S. Embassy in Israel, which in turn was illegally relocated to Jerusalem. So they have 
closed the U.S. Consulate General, which has served for many, many years, almost 200 years, as the key point of contact between the U.S. government and the Palestinian government, between the U.S. people and the Palestinian people, and now relocated to the U.S. embassy to Israel. What it, what, it, what it is called now? It is now called the Palestinian Affairs Unit. So we are an affair of the U.S. Embassy to Israel. The intention is absolutely obvious. It's clear. Before we broke off contacts, I was told directly by a senior, very senior, without naming names, very senior administration official, that we were only bringing old ideas, he told me. And just talking points to the table. The fate, my friends, of 6 million Palestinian refugees is not a talking point. We told them that and we tell them that now. Ending the injustice of 5 million Palestinians living under military occupation and enduring a separate military legal system to those around them is not an old problem. This is not an old problem. The 2 million Palestinians in Israel whose status as a second-class citizen was cemented with the passing of Israel's nation-state law last year, are not a talking point. Nearly half a million Palestinians in Jerusalem are not a figment of our imagination. They own every home, they own every shop, they own every mosque, they own every church. This is not a figment of our imagination. It's reality. When President Trump said that I'm merely recognizing reality, that was a disrecognition of reality. Reality is that the half a million Palestinians living there for millennia must be heard and respected. These are real people. They have real rights. They, we, must be heard. What is old, the only thing that is old, is our connection and our attachment to the land. That goes back millennia. But let me borrow since this administration is very fond of their own terminology and language, let me borrow the language of the administration and talk about what I will call the five ultimates. The first is the ultimate promise. This promise, my friends, was made in the 70s and the 80s by the US-led international community. It was made to us, the Palestinians. This promise was, and it was held out, that the, that the prospects of a two-state solution with the creation of a Palestinian state on the 1967 borders. The promise was, should we accept international legitimacy? Should we accept international resolutions? Should we accept the state of Israel inside the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital and a just resolution to the issue of refugees? Should we accept all that? The US-led international community will deliver the two-state solution, will deliver the end of Israel's occupation, will deliver the advent of a sovereign independent state of Palestine with East Jerusalem as its capital. That was the ultimate promise. This has been and continues to be the international consensus up until today. Then as a result of that ultimate promise came in the late 80s, to be precise, in 1988, the ultimate compromise by us, the Palestinians. The international promise, the ultimate promise, paved the way for the ultimate compromise on our part when in 1988 the PLO recognized Israel inside 1967 borders, formalizing that recogn uh, recognition uh, uh, formally in 1993 at the advent of the peace process, which that moment in 1988 to declare a state on the West Bank and Gaza, which is 22% uh, percent of the land, uh, indicated to the world our acceptance of international resolutions, our acceptance of international promise. And it led that ultimate compromise did lead to the Madrid peace process and the Oslo process in the early 90s. Oslo saw for the first time Israel recognizes that Palestinians had a right to represent themselves, which was an achievement. Like all other peoples, that meant they had a right to self-determination. Regrettably, after that ultimate promise that was followed by the ultimate, uh, 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 the ultimate compromise, which was essential for the cause of peace, painful on the Palestinians, foregoing 78% of your land, of, of the land you consider your own, before even achieving uh, an agreement was definitely an ultimate compromise. But then we signed the Oslo process, and that now can only be, in retrospect, called the ultimate failure. The process was flawed 
unfortunately. It was flawed because it foresaw a solution being reached in direct negotiations between the two parties, ignoring the vast imbalance of power between the two. By definition, by definition, international conflicts are not solved locally. They are international because there are other actors involved in that and sustain it. They need international mediation. And no, look all over, look at all conflicts. You will find out that they were only resolved when there was a genuine, sustained, meaningful international mediation. We didn't get international mediation. We got the U.S. acting as the sole arbitrator. Those, my friends, those flows led directly to the failure of this process, regrettably, unfortunately. We, are, we live today to pick the pieces. This failure has been picked over many times. I don't wish to dwell too long. But let me here just point two major failures. The first is the U.S. should not have been trusted as a sole mediator, should not have been left alone as a sole mediator. The U.S. failed as a mediator. It failed because it couldn't succeed. Not because it didn't want to, but it could not succeed. Israel is not a foreign policy issue in the U.S. I will repeat this. Israel is not a foreign policy issue in the U.S. It is a domestic issue. This administration is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Then, of course, there was the expansion of Israel's settlements project. That was number two major reason, major factor behind our failure. This expansion happened from day one of the peace process and continued throughout until this very day. It continues at unprecedented pace today. It had a direct material consequence for talks since 1993. If Israel continued to build settlements in occupied territory, a war crime, by the way, under international law, how could it be seriously negotiating the status of that same land? You know, let me use this very simple example. If you and your colleague decide to actually share a, a, a piece of pizza, and then you sit around the table to discuss how do you share that piece of pizza, and then your opponent starting eating that piece of pizza, I don't think any sort of negotiating, negotiation would make any sense by then. And this simple example is exactly what has been happening over the last 25 years. We were discussing to share that piece of land when that piece of land was being grabbed as uh, we speak. And if Israel continued cutting off East Jerusalem from its West Bank hinterland, how could we believe that this would become the capital of our independent sovereign state? If Israel continued building colonial settlements in the Jordan, Jordan Valley, deep in the West Bank, along the borders with Jordan, how could we ever assume control of our own borders? This expansion was a direct result of the format of the peace process. Never was Israel sanctioned. The U.S. approach to mediation was always one of offering incentives to Israel rather than holding it accountable. That was in stark, stark difference to how the Palestinian side was treated, how we were treated. We had to prove our state worthiness. I'll repeat this. We had to prove every step our state worthiness. We had to earn our independence. We, the victims, were expected to protect the occupation and the, victim, the victimizers, and by the way, which we do. It was unprecedented that Israel, as the occupying power, demand protection from and by the victim. I'll repeat this. Israel, as the occupying power, in full control of our land, resources, people, in captivity, demand protection from and by the victim. Yet, we had to do it under such process. But all that has brought the fourth ultimate, which is the ultimate retraction. What we witness today, since at least the beginning of 2017, since President Obama took office, uh, I'm sorry, President Trump took office, what we have been following is the ultimate retraction. Successive U.S. administrations may have only paid lip service to the framework for talks. That is the international law and legitimacy. But at least there was a yardstick, a very clear yardstick. The Trump administration has thrown away the yardstick. It is siding with a vision of greater Israel that precludes not only, by the way, Palestinian national rights, but even Palestinian individual rights. It is not 
siding with Israel itself. All previous administrations have sided with Israel. All previous ad administrations have given sustained military and political and legal and economic support and financial support to Israel. But this administration is siding with Israel's illegal settlement project. This is the real change. It is unraveling the ultimate promise and wi widening the clock or I may have said even putting the clock backward to a time when there was no engagement with the legitimate representatives of the Palestinian people. We are accused of holding on to outmoded ideas. But it is the US that is trying to turn back time. We reject this. We do reject this attempt. Everything this administration has done has served the settlement project. But it does not serve peace. It does not serve the cause of peace. Not in Palestine, and I assure you, not anywhere. And therefore, this, this brings me to the fifth and the last ultimate, which is the ultimate consequence of all of this, which is what I have been thinking over the last few days. How do I present to you such a distinguished audience in such a renowned platforms and people of good hearts and good brains who have been part of the lively discussion about conflict resolution? What would be the ultimate consequence? of this severe transformative moment we witness, be it in Israel and the elections, be it in the White House and this hostility by the Trump administration, and be it our inability to actually see, see clear ahead. But here is what I have out of conviction, out of belief, out of my knowledge of our leadership and our people have come up with. If, <coughs> if the promise has been retracted, and the promise has been retracted by the Trump administration. The compromise cannot last long. These ideas are hitting in our heads. They are being repeated. Many of our friends are telling us, under such uh, pressure, and so under such sheer pressure, if the party that has issued the promise is reneging on that promise, how can you keep your compromise? Something has to give in there, they are telling us. But here we go, my friends. We have only two options at this point in time. Either we can sink the boat, simply sink the boat. We can throw all the cards in the air, dismantle the Palestinian Authority, and let the occupation take back its responsibility for all the occupied territory. Or, number two, we can affirm ever more strongly our commitment to international law and the two-state solution. But change our strategy for implementing it. Well, we choose, we choose as President Abbas has made abundantly clear the latter. We choose the latter because this is not about goals. This isn't about goals. There have only ever been two just resolutions to the Palestinian-Israeli question. And before I go on, my friends, let me stress these just resolutions that we accept. The first is Palestinians and Israelis. All Israelis, Jews and non-Jews, enjoy full and equal political, national, civil rights in two, two democratic states on the territory of historic Palestine, divided according to international resolutions and law. Number two option that is acceptable to us and would be a just resolution to the situation and to the issue is that Palestinians and Israelis enjoy full and equal national, political, and civil rights in one, one democratic state on the territory of historic Palestine. This is not about these goals. We accept either. Israel rejects both. And again, I need to remind you, when I mean Israel, and when I say Israel, it is the Israeli government. Israel rejects both. And this is a question of strategy for us now. It is a pure question of strategy. This is not about the what. We know what is the what. It is about the how. How are we going to attain our rights and achieve our goals? And we are clear about our intentions. We have learned the lessons of 25 years of failed peace process. And let me tell you what we have learned. Number one we can no longer accept to uh, pursue a bilateral process with the U.S. as a sole mediator. The expansionism of Netanyahu and the general rightward shift of the Israeli public make it absolutely crystal clear 
that Israel is not interested in finding a just solution. The unilateralism of the Trump administration demonstrates that the U.S. has abandoned any pretense of adherence to international law. Instead, we must seek international support for a multilateral process that relies on the framework of international law and preserves the achievements we have made up to this very point. Why this, you may ask. And I understand, you should ask the question, why, why, why this? And everybody should ask, why, why to defer to an international community that so far has been toothless? What is the alternative, I ask? And I, I want to, really, we are asking, what is the alternative to the international order? What is the alternative to the international system? What is the alternative to our universal values? Is there any other international order that can appeal to, we can appeal to? I want an, anybody to name for me any other international order that we can appeal to. Is there another law to which we have recourse? No, we don't. And we don't need to. The post-World War rules-based international order is fine. It's absolutely fine. It was not invented to serve us, the Palestinians. It was established after the carnage of the World War II for one purpose, one purpose, never again. And we Palestinians stand with the never again after the horrors that happened during the Second World War and the First World War. It was established exactly to res resolve conflicts like ours. The international order is fine. What is lacking is the necessary international will to implement it. What is not lacking, however, is our commitment to it. And the worst kind of wound is going to be a self-inflicting one. And we would be inflicting one should we veer away from this international legitimacy. We will continue to bolster and defend the achievements we have made over the past 25 years. We, the institutions we have built and the preparations for statehood we have made with the support, I may add, the generous support of the international community. We have resisted the Trump administration's attempt at isolating us. We have done so successfully. We have the continued consensus of the international community behind us, minus the Trump administration. We are not isolated and alone. The Arab League in Saudi Arabia last year and in Tunisia this last month has yet again affirmed its support for the right of the Palestinian people to a state with East Jerusalem as its capital and a just resolution to the issue of refugees. And by the way, the summit in Saudi Arabia last year was called by the Saudi king, King Salman, the summit of Jerusalem, because Jerusalem to the Arab world, to the Muslim world, to the entire region is the city of God. And it is a, a sacred city to uh, the hundreds of millions of Muslims worldwide. What else the king of Saudi Arabia could have said or named uh, that summit shortly after the announcement by President Trump. This issue remains of the utmost importance to the Arab and Muslims across the world, and of course Christians and Jews. We are not alone. The Arab world and the international community as a whole remain committed to the two-state solution and to its own resolutions. Number two of our strategy, we will continue, we promise you, to encourage a strategy of popular resistance. And this is a unique opportunity to really define what do we mean by popular resistance. People have a way of turning their weaknesses into strength. If we are fractured, and unfortunately under the sheer force of the military occupation, of the colonization, of the walls, of besieging Gaza, we have become fractured as a nation, geographically flat, uh, fractured, fragmented if you may. But if, if we are fractured, our struggle becomes localized. Witness, for instance, the thousands of Christian and Muslims who took to the streets in Jerusalem not long ago, bringing it to a standstill and reclaiming their rights to their city and holy sites, defeating Netanyahu when he attempted, attempted at altering the nature and identity of their city and directing uh, ele electronic gates uh, and imposing sanctions on them. They have won that battle peacefully, non-violently, by using the prayer mattress as a method of resistance. What a scene, what dignity of the people, our people in Jerusalem. 
Every week, there are unarmed civilians protest in different parts of the West Bank, all over the villages, against the theft of uh, land to the wall Israel is building up and down in the, in the occupied territory. Every week, every week, there are unarmed civilian protests in Gaza, where people are marching to assert the right of return to where they came from and where families came from, and also, and also to uh, protest uh, uh, the uh, siege on Gaza that has left two million people on the brink of a humanitarian disaster. This is popular resistance. But popular resistance, my friends, is also keeping Palestine's illiteracy rate to near zero. In spite of the enormous dangers every Palestinian child faces simply in getting to school. Dangers from armed soldiers at military checkpoints who think nothing of throwing children into prison. Dangers from armed settlers with a su supremacist mentality answering to a different legal system. Those are dangers every Palestinian mother. Every Palestinian mother has to weigh every single morning before sending her children to school. And still she sends them to school to learn, to improve themselves. This determination and perverse, uh, uh, perseverance, I may say, this determination and perseverance is the reason Palestine has one of the highest PhD per capita holders worldwide. This is popular resistance. That is popular resistance. Popular resistance is surviving on our land, despite all the above. It is building our institutions, like schools, universities, businesses, and, industry, and, and industries. It is thriving in the face of adversary. It is not just the mass mobilization of everyone everywhere. But that too, by the way, is also only a matter of time. This stage will see the PLO seek out new constituencies, new agencies, and new actors. Already, this process, my friends, have begun, has begun. Last year, we reconvened the Palestinian National Council for the first time in 22 years. The Palestinian, the Palestine National Council is the highest Palestinian uh, political institution. It is the Palestinian parliament, if you may, in exile. It represents every Palestinian of the 13 million Palestinians inside the occupied territories and in exile and outside in, in, in diaspora. This convening of our National Council for the first time in 22 years has resulted in the reselection of the Central Council, the PLO Central Council. The PLO's supreme decision-making body, the Central Council, is specifically we reconvened and reselected the Central Council specifically in order to prepare for possible national strategic decisions that only this body is empowered to make. The Central Council was the body that created the Palestinian Authority. It is the Central Council that can end it. And this year, the former technocratic government was replaced by one led by the Fatah movement. Now is not a time for technocrats. It is a time for political leaders with local constituencies and with the ability to guide and mobilize people. And number three of our strategy, my friends, is this. The international community is not just responsible for peacemaking, but also for ensuring accountability, ensuring scrutiny and accountability. The international system was established to make sure that countries will be held accountable. And why did the occupation hardly figure in Israel's recent elections, you think? Why? Why there was no even discussion about the control of more than 5 million, the lives of more than 5 million Palestinians? Why? Because it's too comfortable. The status quo is too comfortable. The occupation is too comfortable. The colonization is too comfortable. The besiegement of more than 2 million people, putting them in an open cage, open prison in Gaza for more than 12, 12 years is too comfortable. And it's more. It's more than comfortable. It is profitable for Israel. It is profitable for Israel. And let me give you some examples. Israel profits from the resources of 60% of land of the West Bank, known as Area C, that is under its direct military and administrative control. Agriculture, phosphate mining, water, name it, are extracted from our land. There are some 2,000 
Israeli businesses and industries that operate illegally in this area. They don't pay taxes to the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian government. They pay taxes to Israel. The PA, the Palestinian Authority, loses some 360 million annually in lost revenues, in direct contravention of the very Oslo agreements that we signed with Israel. We are a captive market, almost, by the way, the size of Israel's population itself. Journalists are fond of saying that if you want to know the real story, follow the money. And I invite you, my friends, to follow the money. By the same token, if you want to change the story in the flow of money, or at least alter its course, the biggest incentive for Israel to end its occupation is to end its profitability. We have to make it costly. In 2018, the UN compiled a list of Israeli and international businesses that operate in occupied territory. That list is ready. But Israel and US pressure has kept it from being published, unfortunately. We believe its publication is essential. Businesses must be named and shamed for colluding with an illegal military occupation. Settlements are a crime of war. That is very well defined in international law in the Four Geneva Convention. Their products must be banned, not only labeled as the European Union is trying to do. The businesses operating in them must be sanctioned. Any strategy aimed at ending the occupation must target the economic interests that sustains it. If the money is targeted, the story will change. And I assure you, the, st the story will change. If you think the, more, the almost 700,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank are only there for, for ideological or political reasons, think again and go visit some of Israeli studies themselves, some of, of, of TV programs and documentaries that have been uh, conducted about settlements. All of them will tell you the prime reason why they are there is economic reason, material reason, profitability. And ladies and gentlemen, I am by nature an optimist. I am. I think you can blame my mother for that. My president is. Our people are. We have to be. We have to be uh, optimists. Seeking international support follows directly from our insistence on and commitment to international law. We believe it is more important than ever now, precisely because the international order is under direct threat from Trump's unilateralism. We believe this is because we believe in this because we believe that this is not just in our interest. This isn't only about Israelis and Palestinians. It is in the interest of the international community as a whole. It is in the interest of global peace. What happens in Palestine does not happen in isolation. We will reverberate for far and wide, as has been the case all along. You undermine the international order at your peril. Open that door and see what happens in the South China Seas, in the Ukraine, in Kashmir, in Croatia, Slovenia. The list goes on, my friends. Yes, the picture is not pretty at this moment. But we must also not lose sight of the upside. And there is an upside. And there are positives, positives we can use in our favor. Chicago is known as the city that works. We too can make this work, my friends. The Trump administration has allowed us to escape the flaws of the peace process. It did allow us to escape the flaws of the peace process, to remove that fig leaf from a structurally failing peace process. It has done so by outlining a stark choice for us all as we move forward. On one side, we have unilateralism, colonialism, and the law of the jungle. The law of the jungle. It is the side that is comfortable with a system of, of apartheid that sees three legal systems in the area of historic Palestine. Three different legal systems. One for Israeli Jews, that is liberal democracy, one for Palestinian citizens of Israel, that is considering them a second-class citizens, and one for the Palestinians in the occupied territories adopting military rules and not even abiding by international law that governs military rules. It is the side of an administration, and I mean here the Trump administration, that is willing to undermine international law and international order for sh short-term political gain, very short-term political gain. On the other side, it is our side, 
It is the side that there is multilateralism, multilateralism, cooperation, international law, and the principle that all people are equal before that law, that all people are equal before that law. Not the stronger, not the one with the more connection in Washington, but all people are equal before that law. It is the side of those who believe that there is and there must be such a thing as justice, that all are entitled to it, and that a rules-based international order is worth preserving. It is the side of the founding principles of the United Nations. It is the side of the founding fathers of the United States of America. It is the side we stand on, and we intend to move forward. Thank you very much.